planning and market. China rejected the IMF and World Bank shock therapy and developed its own approach. At the same time, on the other side of the Himalayas, you have India, which is seeking a similar but more sustainable approach to economics, Bhutan, which pushes gross national happiness, and all kinds of micro-initiatives such as Bangladesh, which is pioneering microfinance. What this book puts forward is a new economic paradigm. The paradigm is the Himalayan consensus. That consensus is trying to lead an alternative to the one model approach of neoliberal capitalism of Washington, D.C., and introduce a concept that's more broader, egalitarian, and that's compassionate capitalism. Hmm. Lawrence, it sounds good in theory, but and you've just mentioned two of the biggest powerhouses, India and China, but what about some of the other emerging nations who are relying on funding from the IMF? How, in fact, can they move away from this top-down economic theory you're talking about? Well, one of the examples I use in the book, the Anti-Globalization Breakfast Club, is actually the example of Nepal. And here in Nepal, it was IMF, World Bank, and this type of institutional funding, which actually did not get down to people, did not produce results, and to a great extent, was a cause or a spark of the Maoist revolution, which created a civil war in the country for 10 years. In this book, we look at the example of what went wrong in Nepal and what can go right. It's actually not just a, a book that's a set of ideas. What I'm actually doing with the Anti-Globalization Breakfast Club is providing a, what I call a manifesto for a peaceful revolution. That manifesto actually tries to lay out a very clear blueprint of steps that can be taken from restructuring institutions such as the World Bank and IMF to actually introducing on a much broader scale microfinance not only in the Himalayas but also in urban areas of industrialized countries like America which need these programs as well. Yeah, so it's well, actually not just a book about ideas, it's actually a book about how to take those ideas and implement them. All right, Lawrence, listen, uh, you've mentioned the phrase peaceful revolution a couple of times already. No doubt that in the last 25, 30 years, uh, you know, a lot of people have gotten been lifted out of poverty and gotten extremely rich uh, in China, and you pose China right now as uh, one example of uh, the sort of alternative to the Washington Consensus, how it's basically uh, still uh, communist, uh, state-run and planned, trying extremely hard and maybe not doing such a good job at controlling uh, a private sector, which is right now more important than the state sector. Having said that, though, these are also the guys that are one of the biggest backers of North Korea, so how peaceful is that? Well, first of all, I think you're mixing up the issues completely. China is not a country that is trying to suppress private enterprise. One of the great successes of the China model was to very clearly move from a planned economic system, realizing that that did not work in, the, in, in this century, and to step by step introduce a market economy. And this is where China departed from the IMF and World Bank approach, which preached a shock therapy, one model, uh, immediate liberalization of capital markets, immediate liberalization of foreign exchange, immediate privatization of enterprises. But in a country that's been under a socialist system for so many years, all the means of production, distribution, and social structures cannot cope with shock therapy. That's why you had so much collapse in the post-Soviet Union era. And certainly after the Asian financial crisis, when many of the IMF formulas were applied, they led to disaster. And what China did was it departed from that model. This is the, the key point to learn from China right now. How much have they really departed? We don't when... have to fit with one model. Okay, I mean, how much have they really departed, even if the state sector is bigger than, uh, excuse me, the private sector is bigger than the state sector, it's despite the central government's efforts, because, I mean, all help, all credit, all everything else still goes to big state-owned companies. I mean, it's actually amazing that the private sector has been able to thrive the way it has. I, th I think your information is not, 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 not consistent with what's happening in China. I mean, when I was working with Zhu Rongji's team back in the 1990s, in 1998, all of the, about 80% of the state's actual income came from 500 state-owned enterprises. That whole system has changed. More than 60% of China's exports are all from the private sector now, many from foreign investment. 
So actually what has happened is China has encouraged the private sector. In many cases, even enterprises that are labeled state-owned enterprises are renting their licenses out to private operators. So you have a mixed economy. And really what we're looking at with this is saying you can have a mixed economy. You don't have to have one model. You don't have to be fundamentalist in your economic theory. We're calling in this book for a middle way. That middle way is between market and planning. It yeah. is to use the tools of either yeah. as necessary to get people out of poverty. That's the Himalayan consensus. Okay, listen, Lawrence, we'll get back and talk more in uh, just a bit. Uh, Lawrence Brom there. Uh, live from up in uh, Hong Kong. We are back with uh, Lawrence Brom, author of the Anti-Globalization Breakfast Club Manifesto for a Peaceful Revolution, staying with us from our studios live up in uh, Hong Kong. Lawrence, uh, uh, we left off, you were talking about uh, the Himalayan consensus as opposed to the Washington con uh, consensus and the need for compassionate capitalism. What we're seeing uh, happening in the U.S., though, the nationalization of uh, banks, bailing out of car companies, etc., this whole too big to fail uh, theory in exercise. Is that compassionate capitalism in, in your mind? I think many people in America are calling for compassionate capitalism. You know, we've gone on the assumption for so long that greed is the sole motivation of everything. This is the premise of Adam Smith's invisible hand. But people are motivated by more than greed. They're also motivated by compassion. They have other sides to them. And certainly, I think much of the problems in America's financial collapse, global financial collapse, has become caused by too much greed. Part of what this book, The Anti-Globalization Breakfast Club, is calling for is to bring a little bit more compassion back into capitalism. Okay, listen, Lawrence, uh, we got to go. Great to talk to you, sir. Thank you for the time and for coming on uh, this morning. Lawrence uh, Brom there, uh, author of The Anti-Globalization Breakfast Club Manifesto for a Peaceful Revolution from our studios live up in Hong Kong.